This is a report on the North Carolina mountain people. Farmers, merchants, lawyers, blacksmiths, millers, spokesmen from all walks of life in such counties as Yancey, Mitchell, Avery, Buncombe, Watauga, giving rank views on what's happening in our Appalachians. Dr. W.D. Weatherford of Black Mountain and Professor Cratus Williams of Boone are major voices in our story. Have the tone of urgency and impatience, there is good cause. For the Appalachian region, one of America's last lingering frontiers is in trouble. Yes, I'm a mountaineer. My people have been on the border since before the American Revolution. They were long hunters, Indian fighters, fighters in the Revolution, and leaders in the Whiskey Rebellion. Later, they fought in the Civil War, became Kentucky Mountain feudists, and have remained in the mountains down to this day. I've heard a good many misconceptions of, of mountain people during my lifetime, and many years ago, I became interested in trying to learn the facts about the mountain people. What I have learned has been an eye-opener. was dotted with mills everywhere. I, I, I could count uh, six or eight good mills. And now, the Weinbarger mill is the only one I know of in operation. The mill, of course, and uh, its work is going down because of the fact that uh, men have quit farming and uh, the farms are growing up in woods and bushes and uh, just laying idle. See, this is a land of very little industrialization uh, and too many, too small farms. And these farms have fractionated uh, to the point where they're not productive and uh, the youngsters uh, are just bleeding out of the land. A great mass of our boys drop out at the seventh or eighth grade. The result is the average educational level for the entire seven Appalachian states is seven and two-tenths years for adult people. And of course, that's very, very low. The, the population in these counties hasn't appreciably changed uh, in this century. Uh, some of the counties have less population today than they had uh, back in 1900. We lost the last 10 years, from 50 to 60, we lost a million, 132,000 people out of these mountains. We didn't have a net loss of that much because we had 935,000 babies born. But there are lots of people left these mountains to go somewhere else to get, to get to better wages. Here is Burnsville, a Carolina town locked in the ancient, weather-worn Appalachian Mountains. Once those walkways trembled with the lusty commerce of miners, lumberjacks, and farmers. The home of lingering frontiersmen, of lonely gunsmiths, who still fashion their own hunting weapons. Of mountaineer printers, whose gothic journals crackle with self-reliant thought. iron workers, the great grandsons of Daniel Boone himself, who still forge hot metal into a farmer's plowshare or a delicate work of art.
aging craftsmen of another era when there was a bristling boom town. Now, like many of her upland neighbors, Burnsville is a town in mourning for a lost youth. Here's the town mayor. Leadership is one of our important problems here. Uh, I stated that uh, a large percentage of our high school graduates, practically all the <coughs> college graduates, have left. Uh, most of our businessmen now are older people like myself, and we just don't have the, the young people to take part in the, uh, leading the community affairs. There's a big shortage of employment for our people. The county lost 14% of its population between 1950 and 1960, due principally to the fact there are simply no good jobs for people here. Our factory closed, and I was in unemployed, and uh, I was a machinist for the company. I worked approximately five years till it closed down. We don't have uh, enough payroll. So many people uh, have to go away to seek employment elsewhere. Uh, the merchants uh, would like to uh, make progress, and we have made progress in time past. Uh, it's much better than it used to be since our uh, industry come in, but we need more. It is a paradox that in this area where so many minerals have been discovered, and such large quantities of certain minerals exist, that there is no apparent future for the mineral industry. Those that we have in quantity have had this decline in price. Those that are valuable are present in such small quantities. As a result of this, there is no long-term picture, encouraging picture for the mineral industry. The first settlers in the Appalachians, five generations ago, did not come to shovel in mines or to found a lumbering industry. They were fresh out of the battlefields of the American Revolution. Their demands were simple, good farmland and a new life in the western wilderness. Boone, Houston, Sevier, Crockett. They were the riflemen who would later send Andrew Jackson to the White House. With the Cherokee Indian vanquished, life for the pioneers was good in the mountains. The sowing of seed corn on slanted acres, pure water, wild honey and game, cattle and swine mast fattened in the green valleys. And every spring, the sharp cry from an oak cabin of a newborn child. In breaking the mountain new ground, the first families staked out the broad river valleys, new wagon loads from the Shenandoah, and they pushed into the rich creek bottoms. For the belated settler, only the shadowed coves, the spiny ridges. It was the early 19th century, the time of fertile beginnings and manifest destiny. Large families multiplied, and the farms grew smaller. A proud people, whose ancestry had already earned a reputation for hard toil and fierce independence. Contrary to what a great many people think, these Appalachian Mountain people are not primarily English, they are primarily Scotch, made up of two groups. First, the Scotch-Irish, who came by way of Ireland and picked up the name Scotch-Irish, and who began coming into this country. Now, of course, there are other strains of uh, ethnic stock in these mountains, certain number of Germans, certain number of uh, Dutch, certain number of uh, French Huguenots, and here and there, uh, Swiss, but uh, the overwhelming majority of the people in these mountains are Scotch. 
Well, uh, it would seem to me that the mountaineer was not radically different from other rural people at the time of the Civil War. Uh, in fact, uh, there is some evidence to indicate perhaps he was a little ahead of uh, the average southerner, even ahead of, uh, uh, we say, the second or third rate plantation owners. Uh, objective travelers through the mountains before the Civil War re reported uh, uh, excellent uh, homes through the mountain valleys, a uh, certain degree of culture and reading matter and evidence, hospitality, and uh, the homes were well kept, the barns looked good, uh, the people were proud and prospering. But the Civil War came along. During the Civil War, propaganda writers for the North tended to present the mountaineer as a kind of a poor white in sympathy with the South. The Southern propaganda writers tended to present the mountaineer as a kind of a misplaced Yankee in sympathy with the North. Both types of writers, of course, misrepresented him. During the Civil War, the uh, great Appalachian barrier, uh, highlands, uh, divided the Southland and um, made it, uh, as a result, impossible for the uh, uh, South to mobilize its resources uh, properly. And uh, it enabled, in the final analysis, uh, uh, the uh, North to more easily uh, conquer the South and preserve the Union. The mountain people had not been slaveholders in the main. They were compromised by the war. Their sympathies lay largely with the North. Following the war, when the South lay in uh, the throes of Reconstruction, uh, there was not very much to be passed around for anybody in some of the states. The mountaineers were left on their own devices, and they entered into a series of up to three generations of ignorance uh, and poverty. And they lost sight of their old thrifty ways. They uh, corroded in character. Uh, they became ignorant. Their culture became an oral culture rather than a written culture. And uh, uh, they remained in, in this situation until after the turn of the century. The title of this song is The Last Old Shovel. That's the last shovel that's used at a burial in the country in the mountains. <laughs> self-reliant, he is disinclined to cooperate with other people. Uh, this means, of course, that uh, it's a little difficult for uh, mountaineers to come together to do things on behalf of their own communities. They're a reticent type of people. I remember having a man come up to see me, and uh, he thought I knew who he was, and he said hi, and I said hi, and he stood around four or five minutes and turned around and walked off, and I walked down to see him the next day, and this is over in the mountains here, and I said, why didn't you tell me who you were? Well, he said, I thought you knowed. <laughs> they will not talk very much. The most unfortunate thing about all this is that Actually, the mountaineer did not come into contemporary civilization in the Depression years. And because of the economy in those days, he came in through the back door. And uh, that uh, means that uh, he left uh, an unpleasant impression of himself when he migrated outside the mountains to the cities of the north. mountain family became a mountain clan.
each home a shut-off island unto itself. Civil war had left a bitter legacy of revenge feuds, brigandage, economic paralysis. The Appalachians were locked out of the 19th century. But the primitive frontier folkways remained on. The outlander was swapping his horse for the motor car. But mountain son and daughter still grew up by the cedar churn, the apple press, the draw knife, and the iron kettle. There was no money, only a barter system. All mouths had to be fed pone and pork from the land. The only thing in plentiful supply was human life, life that was often bitter. The custom of splitting up the farmland among heirs continued. Families began to subdivide themselves into tiny patches of poverty. it came the age of the Depression. The mountaineers had always known hard times. Now it was almost unbearable. The old clung to their hills. But the young had to find a new life somewhere else. They emigrated to Cleveland or Baltimore or Detroit. Scorned by city folks, no longer on a par with their neighbors. They were now called Hillbilly. The mountain clan was split asunder. Well, I can't tell you much, but I know we just, we started out with nothing much to live on, but we just worked and made what we had, what we raised the children on, and then we kept making a little along to send them to school. They were good in school from the time they first started when they were little, right on, and they kept it up as long as they went to school. And then since they've been out of school, I think they've done well, all of them. I don't see anything wrong with what they've done. I, I, there's not much I can tell you. It's just kind of everyday living for us here, <laughs> what they've gone through with. Well, the Mountain family once was a very solid institution. Uh, there was no such thing as divorce in the Mountain family. I'm sorry to say that there is considerable divorce growing in the Mountain families. We find a good many children who are uh, left orphans. The father walks off and leaves them or something else. That's partly due to the fact that the, woman, uh, the women I have uh, fallen heir to the idea of uh, liberty of women, and they won't do the things they once did. They won't just won't. They won't take the punishment they once took. Moonshiner, Ridge Runner, Hillbilly. Those are the epithets cheap fiction writers gave our mountaineers. Perhaps they did not know that those were the descendants of George Washington's favorite revolutionary fighters. Well, to begin with, the mountaineer was presented as a kind of a combination of Daniel Boone and uh, Natty Bumpo. Uh, he uh, entered into fiction following James Fenimore Cooper in the 1830s. Uh, one book in particular that uh, presented a North Carolina mountaineer was Kennedy's Horseshoe Robinson, in which a mountaineer from Burke County is, was the lean, hungry type carrying a rifle in the crook of his arm, uh, wearing homespun clothing and a hunter's shirt. This uh, picture of the mountain air was so indelible that uh, I'm afraid that uh, the average American hearing about the mountain air even yet thinks of him as uh, somewhat along this line, a man who steps out of the bushes with a squirrel rifle in the crook of his arm, wanting to know what you're doing here, mister. There was a lady from New York who had a very poor uh, interpretation of the mountain people. She seemed to feel that uh, we were all the Snuffy Smith uh, type of characters that we may have been back in Davy Crockett's time, perhaps. But 
she asked me if uh, she could see a real mountaineer. Of course, I told her I was a real mountaineer. She wanted to know if I went to school, how I counted my money, did I live in a log cabin, was I going to college. After I'd explained to her that the advantages were more or less the same in the mountains as elsewhere, uh, she wanted to know if I was a rich mountaineer. I told her no, of course, I was a very average mountaineer and that we all live just like anyone else. They have a feeling that those of us who uh, come in from the outside, they call us foreigners, by the way, <laughs> they have a feeling that we are critical of them because they don't live in accordance in the same fashion that we do, and they're, they're very sensitive. They don't like anybody to come in and uh, criticize them. Now, of course, uh, what the mountains have uh, really needed has been not the reports of third-rate writers of fiction, but some objective research. A fine piece of work was done in 1920 or thereabouts by John Campbell. Uh, after his work, uh, the Southern Highlander and his home homeland, very little was done to determine exactly what the mountaineers' uh, situation is until recently when the Ford Foundation uh, gave a considerable grant to uh, the Southern Council to investigate the cultural, economic uh, life of the mountains, the social life of the mountains, and to identify mountain problems. This is a step forward. This should supply some of the answers that we need to questions concerning the mountaineer and his dilemma. Over the heartland of the eastern United States sprawls the Appalachian mountain range. 80,000 square miles occupied by 5 million beleaguered people. Ford Foundation scholars fanned out over this entire region. They sought to find out why it lags behind the rest of the country in schooling, health, transportation, government and income. Included in the survey were the mountain counties of western North Carolina, 22 of them in all. The interviewers posed sharp questions. Is there a peculiar mountain attitude? What does the mountaineer expect out of life? What does he believe in? We had some 70 or 75 people in the field interviewing individuals and families for a number of months and we interviewed a good many thousands of people. We only found six people who said definitely they did not believe in a God and we only found six, eight who said they did not believe in answer to prayer so that there's no skepticism in these mountains. There's just indifference. They just don't pay any attention to what's going on, but they believe in religion. Unfortunately, the churches are very small. 21% of all the churches in the Appalachian Mountains have 25 or fewer members, which means to say the churches are very weak. My own feeling is we've got to have a good deal of consolidation, just like the schools had consolidation. But there's a great deal of fighting of that. Local people don't want to give up their little church because their grandfathers and grandmothers were buried in the cemetery there and they don't want to give up the church. But we've got to have stronger churches. Secondly, we've got to have better trained ministers. 43% of all the ministers in the Appalachian Mountains have high school training or less. And no man has any business representing the great issue of religion on a 12th grade education. And <laughs> that's what we've got. The mountain home and school, once teeming with frontier voices, now uncertain companions, both weakened by loss of members. The Southern Appalachians have been called America's number one problem area. And where nearly a fifth of the adults has never gone beyond grade five, the greatest problem of all is education. Here the mountain people describe their schooling dilemma. 
the, one of the outstanding teachers in a state teachers college in the South, in the Appalachian Mountains. She told me that of a thousand students she'd taught in the last ten years, she'd gone through every card. She had not taught a single solitary student who graduated with a straight A record who stayed in that state to teach. And she told me she had not taught a single student who graduated with a straight C record who didn't stay in the state to teach. And I said to the state superintendent, just how long will it take us to reduce ourselves to absolute mediocrity, educationally speaking, on any such basis as that? Incidentally, one of our problems is lack of uh, school consolidation. We have about 967 high school students in Avery County. They go to three separate high schools, which are located within 12 miles of each other. Um, the, the schools are too small to have really good faculty and uh, uh, in the sense of teachers being able to specialize in their subjects and uh, to have a good curriculum. That's one of the needs. We, uh, vocational training is almost impossible under the present setup. Many of the high schools are simply not large enough to provide an educational opportunity which removes this unfair competition as between the one who graduates from the small high school, particularly in the mountain area, and the one who graduates from the large high school in an urban or metropolitan area. Well, I think that most mountain students, when they go off to larger universities out of the mountains, have a pretty bad inferiority complex, so to speak because we've come from small high schools. Our classes are small, and we just don't feel like that we're able to compete with the students that have come from large city schools. And I think that a consolidation of high schools in our county would really help this, because with these small classes, we just, our teachers just can't give us the material that we really need. All the data I know anything about would indicate that those who come from small high schools generally uh, are less well prepared immediately for college than those who come from the larger school. But, so far as native capacity is concerned, these youngsters uh, have what I call their share of brains. The third thing is this. We've got practically no vocational training in the public schools of the Appalachian Mountains except agriculture. And nobody's interested in agriculture anymore because in the first place the mountains don't provide much land for agriculture and less than 20% of the people now are, are engaged in agriculture. Once it was 100% but it's only about 20% now. Now that leads me to say another thing. that We've got somehow or other to motivate these boys and girls, to, uh, uh, the boys in particular, to go, want to go to school. They don't think it's necessary. As a matter of fact, when a boy finishes the seventh or even the eighth grade, as most of these boys do, at 16 instead of at 14, they are not prepared then to take the kind of training that's necessary if industry does come in. They have neither enough mathematics, nor enough physics, nor enough chemistry, nor anything else that pertains to mechanical operation. So they can't take the training, and they're left out. Well, during the uh, time while North Carolina first became so actively interested in seeking industry, we did organize this group that we call the Avery County Chamber of Commerce for the purpose of trying to induce industry into Avery County to get new jobs. Um, we got a lot of prospects. We got but little industry. We found that, uh, uh, that our labor supply that is available here, that is the unemployed labor supply, was largely untrained and not really suitable for industrial employment just immediately. In our study of the Appalachian region, we discovered that it would take approximately $400 million to bring our equipment, that means buildings, uh, furnishings, libraries, laboratories, whatever you had, to bring our public school equipment in these seven states up to the standard of the United States, $400 million. Well, there just isn't $400 million on these mountains to, to get to do that kind of thing. The 
fact that the salaries are lowest among the teachers in the mountain section, I think is some indication of the index of education of the mountain people. And if we do consider that education is not a regional matter, but is more of a national matter, then find efforts of the local community, the state, and the nation must be brought to bear upon this educational uh, problem. I am not one of those who fears federal aid to education, so long as uh, its management is safeguarded at the local level. 